Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stefan Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. Yes, and welcome to, oh my God, what's happening? We have to talk about things because things are happening kind of segment. Um, And if you've been paying attention to what is happening in the United States, you know there is a lot happening here and we are a bit stressed uh, to say the very least. So before we begin, we want to timestamp this because we know so many things are changing. And as you know, as you know, oftentimes before our episodes even publish, (laughs) we are already out of date. But just to go ahead and let you know we're trying, today is May 5th, 2022. Annie, go ahead. What does Revenge that mean to you? Revenge of the 5th. <laughs> <laughs> we always have to have a Star Wars pun if we yep, can. we have to. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and recently, Politico leaked in a, a Supreme Court brief which would overturn Roe v. Wade, uh, which, by the way, was a 1973 ruling that stated unduly restricted state regulation of abortion is unconstitutional, uh, which Justice Harry A. Blackmun wrote for a Texas uh, hearing which again states statutes of criminalizing abortion in most state instances violated privacy, which was guaranteed by the 14th Amendment under the Due Process Clause. We're going to get into that a little more. So what exactly is this briefing that has so many people on high alert? Well, we had to bring someone in to talk to us about this. And today we have Executive Director of Georgia Winlist, Melita Easters. Welcome! Thank yes, you. Welcome. It's a pleasure to join you. Yes. Can you uh, kind of let the people know who you are and why you're here to talk to us? <laughs> Thanks. Mm-hmm. Well, I am the founding chair of Georgia Winlist, which is a 22-year-old state-based pact to elect pro-choice Democratic women in Georgia. And we have helped elect 76 legislators, 46 of whom currently serve over our 22-year history. And so, because reproductive freedom is the core of our mission and the lens we use for endorsing women, this case and this opinion puts what we do in the center of Georgia's political spotlight. Yeah, so we needed to do something. When it comes to, obviously, reproductive rights, we are very loud about where we stand on Sminty. And one of those things that we've been talking about in the past, what, how long have we been here, Andy? Three years? (laughs) Is that women in uh, political positions and leadership is important and impacts a lot of these issues that we have been talking about and now are very concerned about. Um, So yeah, before we start into all of that, can we talk a little bit about the briefing? Um, And can you kind of tell us what you read through as because you, you definitely have been talking about this out loud and I know has been a center point as you are in this uh, political time because we are all in the middle of the primaries, um, what this briefing has for us. Well, for for the judge Alito to say Roe was egregiously wrong from the start is pretty devastating to the entire pro-choice movement. And it means that existing laws like the Georgia six-week ban, which is currently under a stay by federal court order, that law was passed in 2019, would then immediately go into effect. And I've read in, in one report today the fact that this leak allows women who are currently pregnant, who are thinking about their options, it puts a timetable on them to hurry up. Because many court decisions give a window when the ruling will take effect. The draft by Justice Alito does not give a window to ease in. So this leaked decision does put all pregnant women on notice that if you are are considering an abortion, you need to go ahead and have it now because the state laws that are regressive that have been stayed by federal courts that are awaiting court review or that are awaiting a Supreme Court opinion from this Mississippi case, the minute it's overturned, you might not have the same options you had the day before the decision goes into place. Right. And you know what, let me backtrack a little bit because uh, you actually have some personal connections to the original uh, Roe v. Wade. Can you kind of talk about that decision and even talk about uh, what happened in Georgia as well? 
Yes, it is because I've been at this work for so long and I'm old enough to be a grandmother. Um, I have had the pleasure of meeting both Sarah Weddington, who argued the Roe v. Wade case in front of the Supreme Court on several occasions, and I've met Marjorie Pitts Haynes. Both of these ladies are now deceased, but Marjorie Pitts Haynes argued the Doe v. Bolton case on the same day as Roe v. Wade. And Doe v. Bolton was a Georgia case before the court on the same day. And and the judges decided to hand down their ruling from the Texas case. But not everybody in Georgia realizes that Georgia had a long history for progressive abortion policies at the time the Roe v. Wade decision was handed down. In fact, women had greater access to reproductive services and abortion procedures back then than in many states, including the Northeast. Wow. That is something that is new to me. Like, I learned it recently, and I was kind of like, well, have I never heard about this? Well, <laughs> I live here. The, the, the thing is, number one, both of you are relatively young. And so <laughs> you have never lived in a time when contraceptives were not readily available and when abortion was not safe and legal. It may have been cumbersome to get an abortion. It may have required some travel or some wait periods, but at least it was safe and it was legal. And and what we forget sometimes is that the wide availability of the birth control pill came at about the same time as the Roe v. Wade decision. Both things happened at the same time. And, And women did not have the same options prior to then. And and what people don't understand is that abortions have always taken place. And abortions, when they are banned, then the wealthy men, the wives and girlfriends and mistresses and daughters of the wealthy will always be able to travel somewhere where abortion is legal. But it closes down the options for the poor and the disenfranchised who don't have the money to travel and the ability to to jump through the hoops that certain states require. And so that means a lot more unwanted children. And, you know, the, the right to life crowd talks about, oh, well, adoptions and foster care. I don't know of a state where foster care is not overburdened. And um, in, in fact, one of my daughters has adopted three children out of foster care. That is a broken system. It is not an option for all of the new unwanted pregnancies, which will happen as a result of greater bans on abortion because of this decision. And there's so much to break down into what you just said, uh, because it definitely is mentioned in the uh, brief that we're going to get into in a second. But before we do start, I find it fascinating that, yes, as you just said, uh, this is not going to stop abortion. No matter how moral high ground that they think this is going to take, and they being whoever is supporting of this briefing, it's not going to stop it. It's just going to stop safe abortions, safe access to abortions, as well as it's not going to stop, again, those who are well off or in uh, a higher level of socioeconomic status and being able to get it safe freely and uh, quietly, because, you know, everything's got to be so hush-hush for it in order to get things done to accomplish what they need to accomplish uh, in, in general. And we also know that this conversation of the late term abortion, which is often brought out, a majority of the time, and I'm not saying all the time, so I'm saying a majority of the time, these types of abortions are not necessarily because they didn't want the children, but because it's life and death. I've had so many friends who went through this process, such a traumatic process, other people calling this anything but the word abortion, but in medical field and insurance, it is considered an abortion, and oftentimes it's not covered, and it's oftentimes costly and damaging. So there's so many layers. The wait time, the additional processes like an extra ultrasound or two, all of those things happen to women. The doctor and the woman know what's necessary when there is this troubled, problematic, complicated pregnancy, which for the health of the mother must end. 
But insurance companies often require extra tests. Um, Hospitals may require an extra test so that everybody has covered their rear ends. And that makes the patient's blood pressure increase. It puts a woman at greater danger. And a wealthy woman might be able to have leverage with her doctors or her insurance company that the poor woman, the underinsured woman, the less sophisticated woman will not have. And so when we add these extra barriers for necessary medical procedures, because abortion is a form of health care, then we will lose lives, and the lives we lose are women of color and women of lesser income. Queer uh, community are deeply affected by these types of laws as well. And I think this is a whole other conversation in what is happening and what, who are they really trying to come after. Not a whole other conversation. It is a conversation. Well, and, this, and conversation. this is the first step. <laughs> Banning right. abortion is the first step. Then there will be a push to ban contraception. Then there will be a push to ban in vitro fertilization. Then there will be a push to go back to the days when gay marriage was not legal. We've already seen the attacks on young transgender athletes. It's, it's, it's all out war on any group the other side can call other. Right. Right. Absolutely. And that's kind of what's infuriating in this language uh, that we're going to jump into, um, which was based out of Mississippi. So this case brought was brought in to the Supreme Court uh, based out of Mississippi, which is called Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. Um, and we're not going to necessarily t- dig too deep into that, but it should be noted Mississippi is one of the trigger states. Um, and we're talking trigger states that, that are ready to go with an overall ban abortion the minute this is turned over. So. Mississippi has brought it into play. They've been waiting for this day. Uh, we've had this conversation, I think since 2016, about what was going to happen. And we're not going to go into 2016 because I might cry. <laughs> but we did want to talk specifics in the actual briefing. And y'all, it's 98 pages, not including the appendix that goes with it. And uh, try to read through it. I went through most of it. I had to take breaks because of the anger it, like I was sitting here yelling at my computer screen <laughs> as if I was arguing with an actual person <laughs> mm-hmm. while reading this because I was so infuriated. So, Melita, if you don't mind, we're going to kind of read through it and just kind of t- discuss those little parts. And honestly, obviously, they all connect and pretty much say the same things repeatedly. But I still just want to talk about what they are saying. Uh, Justice Alito begins the statement with talking about how divisive this issue is, correct, and is a, quote, profound moral issue, which I know is always surrounded in talking about abortion laws and any of those laws. And honestly, any laws uh, implicating marginalized communities, people of color, queer people, always a profound uh, moral issue, right? Which, again, leads to the fact perhaps politics shouldn't play into it at all. Because if it is this moral grounds, how is this political? And yes, I would say that it is conjecture for it to be on moral grounds. Am I, <laughs> am I making that up in my head? Because morality <laughs> is not defined as specific things other than what people judge to be moral. Right? Well, true. And, you know, morals should be more governed by the church and, and those whom people call on for moral authority. Frankly, abortion and the autonomy of a woman to make her medical decisions are really not a matter of morality. It's a matter of a woman's right to the autonomy over her own medical decisions. But by couching it in, quote, moral terms, Justice Alito wants to put down the idea that women should have rights for bodily autonomy and the freedom to choose their own medical decisions. So just having it based in that, uh, everyone already knows where it's going. And it's kind of like, for me, it was high alert. I was like, oh, mm-hmm. oh, here we go. <laughs> he continues on. We hold that Roe and Casey, which they do talk about uh, the case, which was planned Uh, Parenthood versus Casey. Uh, I don't know too much about that case, but it defines similarly, at least in 1990s that this came about. Yes. 
It, it was a right. subsequent case that after it was decided was was sort of the other defining case law about abortion. The Constitution makes no reference to abortion, and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision, including the one on which the defenders of Roe and Casey now chiefly rely, the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. That provision has been held to guarantee some rights that are not mentioned in the Constitution, and this is part I highlighted, but any such must be, quote, deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. The things that come to mind when I hear you read that section are first, abortion is also never mentioned in the Bible, which he, as a practicing Catholic, holds sacred. The other thing is we have to remember who the founding fathers were. They were rich, white men, some of whom held slaves on their plantations. They did not mention women in the Constitution. Women did not have a right to vote. And they did not uh, believe in the sanctity of all life. They believed only in the sanctity of their own. And so to be a strict constructionist in this day and age as he is trying to be, in his opinion, is a rather outdated notion. The the other thing to remember as we hear this opinion is the fact that three of the justices who are signing this opinion, if the case goes forward as the draft, are justices who were appointed by presidents who were not elected by a popular vote, And some of those justices were approved only by deeply disruptive political maneuvering by the other side. And it's all part of a Federalist Society plan. And further, the justices who are now signing off on an opinion which repudiates Roe v. Wade said Roe v. Wade was the law of the land at the time of their confirmation hearings. So there are lots of layers of of, um, fact and history to contemplate when we read this opinion. And there are plenty of reasons for you to want to throw things at your computer screen or or cuss out loud as you read it, because it Mm -hmm. makes all of us angry. The thing that we have to think about and remember as we move forward is how to most efficiently and effectively channel our anger in the direction that makes the most good in the end. I love that. Yeah, I I have such a hard time in reading things like this. And I know the Supreme Court hasn't really taken on anything about critical race theory or the bans that are happening in our schools right now, including just recently happened in in, in Georgia, um, about not teaching some histories because they don't want to have a biased, quote unquote, uh, teachings about race, uh, which is hilarious in itself how that's not biased in itself. But the fact that they have the audacity to talk about nation's history and tradition and talk about history as if it's something to actually link up on, but still want to ignore history as well. It's just, I know I shouldn't be shocked. I'm not shocked. I'm just irritated that this is a continued uh, conversation that is kind of that level of, well, once again, and I know every side does it, I'm sure, whatever, whatnot, picking and choosing for their own purposes. And this theme of this ordered liberty which, by the way, I'm very confused on who gets to say what's ordered and orderly. That is the <laughs> that is the crux of the issue. That is the <laughs> the sword um, they're raising, but they're raising it from a position of power. And many people think we're headed towards a fascism system of government, 
And it's scary to think that people like Alito get to decide what is orderly and what is not. He hardly represents uh, the majority of the will of the people. More than 70% of the nation did not believe Roe v. Wade should be overturned, and the figure for Georgia was 68%. This will be a galvanizing and very unpopular decision by the court, and it heads our country in the wrong direction. Some of the court's previous unpopular decisions during the civil rights era headed our country in a positive forward direction. This decision takes our country back. It does. And I'm not going to get too into it, but it's very reminiscent of what's happening in Poland, including the fact that this was leaked earlier than when it was supposed to be. So, But that's a whole different conversation that we've been having. Um, here's another quote we wanted to include. Rose defenders characterized the abortion as similar to the rights recognized in past decisions involving matters such as intimate sexual relations, contraception, and marriage. But abortion is fundamentally different, as both Roe and Casey acknowledged, because it destroys what those decisions called fetal life, and what the law now before us describes as an unborn human being. Well, this language in some ways is even inconsistent with the biblical types of precedent for what begins life, um, because the ability to breathe, the ability to maintain life outside the womb is what makes the fetus, a person. And philosophers and religious scholars can argue that. Frankly, they're opening the ability for them to go back on all of those other areas where the court has ruled and turn the clock back on other issues as well. We can no more believe the assertions in this part of the opinion than we believed the most recently confirmed justices when they said Roe v. Wade was the law of the land. Right. And we're not going to talk about Senator Collins at this point, but anger, lots of anger in that one. Yeah, I, I find a lot of, of course, we knew coming in, we know the rhetoric and we know these type of languages that come uh, in order to make sure that those who truly see this as a life and death case can can cling to that as a moral higher stance and being able to say, you're talking about murdering babies, aka my family, um, in which we have to have this conversation of like, no, you're not, you're no longer talking about a pro-life, especially right now when we're talking about the fact that you're not helping those who are actually born. When I was a social worker, I watched many a kids die at a young age because no one cared enough to help and blame the death onto themselves, onto these children, and they didn't care. So one of the big reasons I went from my opinion of being pro-life, quote-unquote, and I'm saying this as in the old terms of what I saw myself saying— And of course, this has everything to do with me being adopted and being told I should be grateful that I'm alive and not aborted all through my life um, up until recently. But all of those conversations leading to the fact that, yeah, but I see what's happening here. I've seen the bigger picture and the narrative that that narrative is a heartstring pull type of thing that you want to do. But it's misleading because what you're talking about is just being pro-birth and no longer pro-life because what I have been told that I should be grateful, so therefore, that's what I'm doing, trying to save lives that are out there, but I don't have any help, any assistance, or any backing because people really don't care. And it's typically those who are the loudest about having birthed children that don't care about those children that have been uh, birthed, as we would say. This is very, very true. The same forces who are so ready to ban abortion are also equally and more forcefully ready to cut social services to make sure that there's no mental health provisions and funding. And and also, those people who, my body, my choice about masks, (laughs) are unwilling to um, 
give women the same autonomy over a far more serious long-term medical decision. And what's ironic about all of that, that conversation is how they will weaponize these words so quickly to get their point. And, and this is exactly what's happening in this brief that says things like unborn humans um, and and uh, life after conception. All of these things are very weapons, are weapons of language in order to make someone be like, oh, yeah, I'm definitely in the right if I believe the statute, right? Yeah, absolutely. This is correct. A fetus which cannot sustain life is not an unborn human. Even the premise of these, quote, heartbeat bills are based on a false assumption that the electrical synapses heard in an ultrasound are actually a heartbeat when the heart has not yet formed at that time point in the development of the fetal tissue. Oh, now you're talking about science. So we, we don't, we don't, I'm just, <laughs> just Well, I mean, science is tough to hear for certain right. parts of the political spectrum. They selectively hear it. Yes, they do. <laughs> Going on into the briefing, it says, talking about the Equal Protection Clause, they actually state, quote, which established that a state's regulation of abortion is not sex-based classification and it's thus not subject to the heightened scrutiny that applies to such classifications. The regulation of a medical procedure that only one sex can undergo does not trigger heightened constitutional scrutiny unless the regulation is mere pretext designed to affect an invidious discrimination against members of one sex or the other. And then lists the cases. And as the court has stated, the goal of preventing abortion does not constitute invidiously discriminatory animus against women. Which I'm like, hmm, really? Well, I I wish Ruth Bader Ginsburg were alive to cut him down to size on some of that language. And I certainly hope that our other justices, Sotomayor and Kagan, will take the inspiration of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and channel her in their dissent, which we have yet to see. Right. Yeah, we haven't seen that. I really do wish uh, Judge uh, Jackson was a part of this. <laughs> I really yeah. wish she was already on board right now. Well, well maybe, maybe she can give them some hints from the sidelines. Yes. <laughs> I have a feeling it'd be a doozy. Um, but yeah, that language in itself says a lot to automatically try to take that away when obviously this is a healthcare issue, especially when we talk about, again, what we were talking about when it's high-risk pregnancies, uh, Being pregnant is traumatic in itself. The the level of things. I have a daughter expected to deliver in July, and there are lots of ups and downs on the roller coaster of pregnancy. And it's it damages your body. I mean, it your body is also hopefully if you have a healthy pregnancy, as, as in like everything goes as you would hope then maybe you can bounce back very quickly. But it's not always the case. Uh, I remember having a friend who uh, broke bones during her preg- during her labor, as well as after the fact, having a lot of problems due to her complicated pregnancy. It, there's so many things that we don't even consider and talk about in the aftermath and the beginning, like how it really changes a person's body to go through the process of being pregnant. And other countries are so much more aware of the needs of pregnant women and working mothers and the state support needed for getting a baby, a new citizen, off to a good start than we have traditionally been in this country. Our postpartum health care, our Uh, work leave policies, so many of our policies are so far behind other developed countries. And that disdain for women shows through in the wording of this opinion. Yeah, I think that's definitely been one of the things, all the conversations I've heard, and those numbers you quoted earlier about, you know, 70% of Americans don't want Roe v. Wade overturned. I think that shows how effective um, conservatives who are really 
backing this have been because I was kind of surprised. I'm like, oh, I thought it was much more controversial than that. (laughs) But they've been so effective in making this sound like it's much more popular than it is. And I think the fact that it like got leaked and they were going to do it on the last day of their session, like it was really telling that, that this is about controlling women's bodies and and they're just trying to paint all this moral stuff on it, but they know it's not popular, um, but they've been very effective in their messaging that it is. Well, the messaging around choice and reproductive freedom has been more effectively wielded by those who oppose abortion and oppose contraception and oppose a woman's right to her own medical decisions. They have more effectively wielded the language throughout the last five decades. And that is a sad thing to say, because we have a lot of smart, effective communicators on our side. So we're going to continue with some quotes from this this briefing. On occasion, when the court has ignored the appropriate limits imposed by respect for the teachings of history, it has fallen into the freewheeling judicial policymaking that characterized discredited decisions such as Lochner v. New York. The court must not fall prey to such an unprincipled approach. Instead, guided by the history and tradition that map the essential components of our nation's concept of ordered liberty, we must ask what the 14th Amendment means by the term liberty. When we engage in that inquiry in the present case, the clear answer is that the 14th Amendment does not protect the right to an abortion. Honestly, I'm still trying to figure out what it means by saying uh, the clear answer. (laughs) <laughs> right. <laughs> it will be the job of our dissenting justices to provide the clear answer and the opposite view, and I have no doubt they will be eloquent <laughs> and forceful in their dissent and perhaps sharpen the dissent based on the outcry which has arisen from the leaked draft. And there's a couple of things we're going to go ahead and put in there just because I think it's important. It says, uh, Roe either ignored or misstated this history, and Casey declined to reconsider Roe's faulty historical analysis. It is therefore important to set the record straight. It continues with talking about some of the historical context that he wants to talk about, which is so problematic that uh, I don't understand why he thought it wouldn't be looked into. But he puts two treatises by Sir Matthew Hell likewise described abortion of a quick child who died in the womb as a, quote, great crime and great misprison. C.M. Hell, Pleas of the Relating, uh, which is the book that he's talking about, and the histories of the Pleas of the Crown. And writing near the time of the adoption for a constitution, Blackstone, another historian, explained that abortion of a quick child was by the ancient law, homicide or manslaughter. By the way, this was in 1736. Um, and at least a very heinous misdemeanor. So, I wanted to talk about these two historical references for a second because they seem all cool. By the way, again, this was in the early 1600s, 1700s that this was done. These are things written through the lens of white men. Right. Very rich white men. Probably had never been in a birthing room and certainly had never carried a child to term. In, in, in that era, women often were sheltered away from society while they were pregnant. They went away to a vacation home or a, a second home, or they certainly weren't seen in public. And so to, to go back to that history for a modern-day court opinion shows how out of touch Justice Alito truly is. Right. I mean, let's talk about the history of Sir Matthew Hale of himself. During this uh, whole brief, he writes, uh, Alito actually writes that Matthew Hale calls specific medicines that may have caused or uh, had brought about an abortion potions. So that, in its term, made me laugh. I was like, really? So you're going to put the word potions in there as if it was a magic trick or 
Well, but, but we have to look at the fact that access to ending a pregnancy has often relied upon herbal medicine or various chemical substances known to some and provided. But many of those early potions, if you want to call them that, had long-term lasting detrimental effects on the women who took them. And so having a safe, legal process for ending a pregnancy preserves the health of the women and keeps them alive. Right. And they were right on that. They were calling these potions because they didn't know what else to call it. And they were they didn't want to justify it as, hey, this actually is something beyond that, which, yes, can be dangerous. And we should have that conversation about why this is dangerous. Maybe we should look into safe precautions and protecting people. But no, um, Matthew Hell was actually known as actually executing at least by record, two women for witchcraft. Uh, he's also known as to saying that uh, marital rape really, eh, that's, not, that's not a big deal. So he defended marital rape and his belief that capital punishment should extend to those as young as 14 years old. So the fact that he, Alito, decided to take his name and use it makes it be like, did you really know anything about this dude? Well, he might have known and not cared. <laughs> right, right. Which seems to be a fair standing of the entire process. And yeah. perhaps a fair <laughs> statement of his mindset. Mm. Stale, mm. pale, yeah. male. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, here's some other quotes we want to include. The inescapable conclusion is that a right to abortion is not deeply rooted in the nation's history and traditions. On the contrary, an unbroken tradition of prohibiting abortion on pain of criminal punishment persisted from the earliest days of common law until 1973. And here's another one. Respondents have no persuasive answers to the historical evidence. Neither respondents nor the Solicitor General disputes the fact that by 1868, the vast majority of states criminalized abortion at all stages of pregnancy. So I think it was important that we remember he's taking this context to 1868. And it, it is not a time we want to go back to. The treatment right. of women in that time period is not something we want to go back to. Women did not have the right to vote. My goodness, women could get credit cards only in the 70s. The treatment of women in in the times Justice Alito refers to is not a place the majority of the nation's population wishes to revisit when they truly look at the full consequences of such backward steps. Yeah, and I just keep thinking like, it's a medical procedure, and that's really none of your business. Like, I don't know why. That is the crux of the matter. It is a medical procedure. It is none of your business. I can't think of a single male member of the Georgia General Assembly I would want in the examining room between me and my doctor. Ooh. Ooh. Right. And I just, I know it's like... <laughs> Awful picture. Right? Exactly. <laughs> well, it is but a scary a- picture, but that is where they are placing themselves. That is right. where yes. Alito would put all women with the state looking over their shoulder about their medical decisions. And making them feel guilty about it. And I just can't... I know it's it's been said before, but I, I if there was something like this that impacted men, if we were like... No, you can't do that. What if every time a man wanted a Viagra prescription, they had to go to the doctor in person, they had to subject themselves to something similar to an ultrasound, and then they could only fill the prescription in person at the pharmacy, and then such prescriptions were not available on college campuses, or let's put it in the proper context, you couldn't get a prescription for Viagra dispensed at your old age home. How quickly would they change their minds? Mm -hmm. You know, we could also solve it with saying people with penises should have vasectomies, and that would help prevent unwanted pregnancy. It would certainly help prevent unwanted pregnancies, particularly those that occur as a result of rape. And 
I've right. even seen a meme today that said, have every 18-year-old man receive a vasectomy. And when he has proven he is financially and emotionally secure enough to father a child, he can have it reversed. Right. Some men who father no. children would never have had it reversed, in my humble right. opinion. <laughs> Agreed. Um, and yeah, there's so many things to this because when we're talking about, and I don't think I explained it correctly, even though I did talk about it, the 14th Amendment and the Due Process Clause, we're talking about the right to privacy. We are talking about that on the level of that this should be between the person who is going in for whatever procedure and the doctor point blank. Um, and this could also go into the lines of in vitro fertilization, like being able to be to have a child in this process if they want to. This also goes into the process of not being sterilized. If they don't want to be sterilized, if they don't want that process, can't be forced to do that. That That's along those levels that we're, it's not about, again, they're trying to put this as they just want to kill off babies, which is, again, a weaponized terms. What they're talking about is a freedom for a woman to choose or a freedom for people to choose in general, not just women, but just to have a choice, to be able to have that choice when it comes to their own bodies, point blank. Um, and it's that overarching conversation that everybody's like, this is dangerous for so many reasons, especially when he's talking about national history and ordered uh, liberties. That in itself is dangerous language to become a fascist type of government. Yes, that's not a place where we want to move. All right which is dangerous. Um, and within the, uh, we've only got a couple of more because I was like, I, I can't keep, we can't keep doing this or it's never going to end. Uh, but it does say the court did not claim that this broadly framed right is absolute and no such claim would be plausible. While individuals are certainly free to think and free to say what they wish about, quote, existence, quote, meaning the universe and the mystery of the human life, uh, they are not always free to act in accordance with those Thoughts uh, licensed to act on the basis of such beliefs may correspond to one of the many understandings of, quote, liberty, but it's certainly not, again, ordered liberty. Who makes the order? Who describes the liberty? That's what it comes down to. The court is hoping to describe a liberty that is not in accordance with the will of the majority of the people of the United States. The court is trying to impose the liberty described by the minority of the population and not the majority, based on polling about Roe v. Wade and reproductive freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did that give you what you wanted? <laughs> yeah. oh, yes, perfect. All right, so here's our last one for now. I'm sure we'll revisit this in the future. <laughs> uh, arguments made that women have more freedom now and are protected by law from discrimination and that with safe haven laws and adoption that children are safe and, quote, has a little reason to fear that the baby will not find a suitable home and that the abortion supporters are fearful of losing autonomy and unable to compete with men in the workplace and in other endeavors. And because each has good arguments, decisions should be left to the states. The problem with leaving decisions to the states is that the states will not have uniform laws. There should be a national standard on this issue. And we didn't leave civil rights to the states. We didn't leave voting rights to the states. Sometimes an overarching national priority is needed and necessary. And on the matter of reproductive freedom and medical autonomy for women, that national overarching standard was set by Roe v. Wade. And if the court overturns Roe v. Wade, then national action is necessary because the states have demonstrated time and again that some of them will discriminate. And they're ready. They're ready. And we've already seen what's happened in Alabama, in which they tried to charge a woman who did want her pregnancy, got into an argument, got shot, lost a fetus, and she got charged with murder. We know. And it took it to go to national headlines for her to be released. There are so many sad ways to see this play out with the kinds of reversive laws states are willing to pass. 
And it, it's it, the court is opening the nation up to great tragedy right? if, if they overturn Roe v. Wade. And, and again, what's happened uh, with Missouri stating that their laws are ready to ban abortion and that anyone wor- who leaves the state to get it will be prosecuted as well. There's so many things how this is not just about states' rights. No, this is about controlling women and turning back the clock. Right. And women have to be prepared to help each other. We need to look at how many women serve in elected office, how many women will be making the new laws required by, in some instances, this new decision. In Georgia, 33.9% of the legislators are women. In state legislatures nationwide, the average is 31.1%. And in Congress, there are 26.9% women. Women have to band together and elect other pro-choice women. If we are to have a voice in the rooms where it happens, and these laws are crafted. And we've been very effective in Georgia by electing women to the extent that our women, Democratic women legislators, outnumber the Republican legislators 3.2 to 1. So when we say that Georgia abortion laws are crafted by stale, pale GOP majorities, we're talking about mostly men who truly have no idea about how most of them have no idea about carrying a child to term or the complications of pregnancies, unless their own wives have had complicated pregnancies. And even then, they still have no clue. They, they think they have a little bit of an understanding, but they still do not understand the overall trauma. We don't even talk about postpartum stuff, which is even more traumatic. So the mental health level is even less considered on top of that fact. Absolutely, in the state level, we have to look about what is what they're trying to do and how they're trying to do it. And even though us two elections had the highest number of women running for the first time in so long, it's still a ridiculously low, low number. Well, that is true. But in Georgia, we have a record-setting number of women candidates yet again. Yes. And we also have the highest percentage of contested races on the ballot in November yet again. And so, at least in Georgia, and hopefully in other states, voters have the option. And the way we have the opportunity to flip legislative bodies is by turning out progressive voters in numbers the Republicans can't ignore, and turning out progressive voters in numbers that defeat the other side. So when our turnout is several percentage points higher everywhere, it lifts the entire statewide ticket and it gives Democrats an opportunity to flip seats that Republicans thought could not be flipped. So yes, they've gerrymandered maps and they've made them as favorable as they can, but Georgia is fast becoming a majority-minority state, and those demographics favor pro-choice Democrats. We have to make our voter turnout efforts match the opportunity. I love this. So we've been talking about the elections ever since I've been on, uh, ever, since, ever since Annie and I have been hosting this, because it's it's been record-breaking and changing so much. Obviously, for us in the state of Georgia, uh, it has been quite different and moving to the point that people were so shocked that it did turn blue when it came to the Senate races and very excited about it Um, and having to kind of have people recognize that Georgia is a battleground state and we need to talk about this. But other states are slowly coming to that forward, too. And it's been because of the women. It's been because of the marginalized communities really pushing this. Well, and and what I like to say, and I even have a map of the state of Georgia that we use on some of our materials 
that shows even in places that vote Republican, the tide is turning. The percentage of Democratic performance is increasing. So what I say is a rising blue tide lifts all boats. And so to the extent that we had women candidates who kept their ground game in operation during December and early January in 2021 to be sure that their voters turned out for Senators Ossoff and Warnock, and doesn't that just sound wonderful rolling off the tongue, to have (laughs) two Democratic senators in the U.S. Senate representing the state of Georgia after so many years of Republican control. But yes, it was the women voters who gave them those margins. And it was the places like North Georgia and certain parts of South Georgia where women candidates had turned out the vote and energized the base that turned out again to give them their margins of victory. Yeah. We're going to end this on a high note. We're going to talk about the good things that can come through to this because the one thing we know when women get angry, when marginalized communities get angry, things happen. And we're going to make things happen no matter what happens in the Supreme Court uh, that we can't see that they don't want us to see, which is a question of, huh, in itself, but whatever, traditions, right? What are some of the things that we can do as uh pro-choice, seeking to just have autonomy, just understanding that this is going to greatly affect the rights of the marginalized community. What can we do? The silver lining of this dark cloud is the fact that we have a record-setting number of women candidates. These women, many of them are some of the highest quality candidates, the most energetic, the best educated we've ever seen. So we have these wonderful women candidates on the ballot. We have more women running against Republicans in November than we've ever had before. Winlist has already endorsed the four statewide women and 38 women in legislative seats. We have more than 40 races to still look at for general election or runoff endorsements. So the silver lining of this dark cloud is that because we've been recruiting, because we've been training, because we've been encouraging women to run for 22 years, we have a bumper crop of pro-choice Democratic women to choose from in November. And this opinion, if it doesn't make people mad enough to get out and vote and bring a few friends with them to the polls in November, nothing ever will. This is a time of opportunity, and we must seize the moment. Our friend Melody Bray, shout out to her, who's running here in the state, uh, in, the, in Georgia, who all connected us with Melita, and a friend of the show, I think we mentioned earlier. Uh, we got to watch her progress from, I'm tired, I got to do something to, from grassroots, to, you know what, let me just go ahead and run, because I'm done, and I'm about to make my voice heard. What can we tell people and women out there, especially in those in the marginalized communities, If they want to run, what should we tell them? Well, what we should tell them is the best way to prepare yourself to run in the future is to help a woman woman run this cycle. Learn about campaigning by helping a woman candidate. Learn about what it takes to be on the campaign trail yourself by shadowing a woman candidate and helping her get elected. And then you'll be prepared to be a candidate in the future. And We need good, strong women candidates. And this is an even year in Georgia, so it's the state legislative seats. And we're going to need municipal candidates in the odd year. School board races are becoming all the more important now because of book bans and proposed changes to how History gets whitewashed to match the whims of those who don't want to have children actually learn the truth. And so there's going to be plenty of opportunities in the coming years for women to run for office in even more 
large numbers. And the best way to prepare yourself to be a candidate is to help a current candidate and get involved in helping them get elected. Because as women climb the ladder higher and higher, we always need to have one arm down helping the next person up that same ladder. Right. And uh, you provided us before we did this a lot of um, fantastic resources. Uh, and one was that a couple of years ago, um, some interns working with you, right, found this actual statistical relationship between women in government and uh, pro-choice options yes. in states. My, my wonderful college interns back in 2019, when so many of the states were passing um, abortion bans, when the Georgia six-week ban passed, Ohio, Missouri, Kentucky, Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi all also passed bans. Georgia, of all of those states, had the closest abortion ban vote. In the 180-member House, the ban, the six-week ban, passed with only 92 votes, one more than would have been required. And that was because at the time, Georgia had a 30.5% women legislators. In the other states where there were fewer women legislators, for example, in Louisiana, their six-week ban where only 16% of the legislators were women, passed by a 73 to 29 margin. In Alabama, where 15.7% of the legislators were women, their total ban on abortion passed with a vote of 74 to 3. In Mississippi, the six-week ban, now at issue in the Supreme Court, where 13.8% of the women of the legislators are women, the vote was 76 to 37 in favor of the ban. So having more women in a legislative body matters. By contrast to those southern states, in Nevada, where 52.4% of the legislators are women, their laws to ease and make abortion access more available um, passed by overwhelming majorities. So your vote matters, and we have to vote in numbers Republicans can't ignore. And I use the term Republicans and Democrats because in Georgia, there are no pro-choice Republican women legislators. The last pro-choice Republican legislator was Kathy Ash, and she switched to the Democratic Party many, many years ago. She's no longer serving, but she was the last pro-choice Republican female legislator. Oh, yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. I think that's something that needs to be said because mm-hmm. I know there's a whole conversation of like the left and right and what does that look like? But in Georgia, it's pretty clear. <laughs> well, in Georgia, it for is us. very clear. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on and illuminating a lot of this, Melita. I know a lot of our listeners and us are kind of feeling a little panicked and overwhelmed. And this was such a helpful conversation. So thank you so much for coming on. Where can the good listeners find you? They can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at G-A-W-I-N-L-I-S-T. And our website is www.gawinlist.com. You can also find me on Facebook with my name, Melita Easters. And I am on a public affairs television program Sunday mornings in Atlanta on Channel 5. It's a 30-minute show called The Georgia Gang, and I'm one of the two Democrats who face off against two Republicans every week on Sunday mornings at 8.30 in a moderated discussion. Ooh, yes. That sounds intense. (laughs) It's very interesting. (laughs) Well, listeners, if you have any thoughts about what we talked about today... 
You can always email us. You know, we love to hear from you. Our email is stuffmediamomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can find us on Twitter at momstuffpodcast or on Instagram at stuff I never told you. Thanks as always to our super producer, Christina. Thank you, Christina. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I never told you is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 